Hi everybody, thank you for joining us for our latest webinar uh, as part of our work around autism learning this month. Uh, today I'd like to welcome uh, Serena and Jed who will introduce themselves shortly, but they're going to be talking to us about what good looks like, some reasonable adjustments, but also uh, some lived experience narrative. So I hope you enjoy and, and in the normal way there will be Q&A at the end. So if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end of the session. Great, thank you very much. Serena and Jed, over to you. Hi, my name is Serena Jones. I'm actually a learning disability nurse and I work in one of the acute hospitals in Liverpool. And my name is Jed Jennings and I'm also a learning disability nurse and we are part of what's called an acute liaison learning disability and autism team. So what we've come to do for the next probably half an hour is talk to you about what we do as a service around patients who have autism some of the case studies and, and reasonable adjustments that we've put in place for people and then we're happy to answer questions at the end of that so obviously this is quite an alien way of communicating and it's, it's difficult so thank you questions through anthony and we will work our way through them at the end and um, hope that makes sense I suppose if we start off initially in kind of the development of our service, we were brought into an acute hospital in Liverpool to support people with learning disabilities. Um, and that was to support um, people coming into hospital as patients, but also the staff and um, in the hospitals supporting individuals with complex needs. And it was very clear to us at the very beginning and how we developed our service. And it's about how changes we've made and instead of just being learning disability focused, we've supported people with autism um, and their communication and referrals to the service. Yeah, and I think one of the things we picked up on in the last five years is that um, patients with learning disabilities historically have had a, a poor time in hospital. And as we probably know from certain legislations and, and, and acts and, and, and pieces of documentation, you've seen that before. I think what we realised is that the autistic population often either can have a learning disability and an autism or just autism on their own, but wasn't always getting the same level of care and support when they come into a general hospital. So I think our service was quite forward thinking in the fact that we said we're going to deal with support and help both populations all under the same umbrella really. Um, and that's what we've done. So some of the reasonable adjustments that we've put in place are for the learning disability population. But the two case studies that we're going to talk about today are going to be both patients who are autistic and what we've done specifically for them. Ivo, could you turn over to the next page, please, mate? not playing this morning. <laughs> OK, I, 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 yeah, there we go. Yeah, so I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about first before we went into the case study was about some autism training. And again, I'm quite happy to share with Anthony and the team later on a link to this if people want to access it and have a little look through it. That's not to say we're the biggest experts in the world of autism. We're not. But what we are is we're people who are, who are genuinely trying our best. And what we've done is a couple of years ago, probably four or five years ago now, we designed a learning disability basic level foundation training course for the staff, uh, volunteers and support who work at our hospital because we wanted to improve the care of people with learning disabilities. And as we've done that, we realised that there was the autistic population. There was no training available about them. There was nothing that we we'd wrote up. So we put this together um, and we now train the staff in knowledge about autism and about how to support people with autism in an acute hospital setting. And I think it stemmed initially from a ward who um, wanted to get it right for an individual who um, came into hospital and um, how, how they were communicating with that individual with autism and trying to understand the challenges I suppose that presented to them. So we did a lot of work and a lot of research um, and spoke to our um, autism 
um, colleagues in the sense of there's a team in Liverpool called the Asperger's team. So we liaise quite closely with them all the time um, with individuals who either come into the hospital who have a diagnosis of autism or if we um, feel that they would benefit from their team and they are not aware of them. Um, so there's lots of liaison work done. So we've developed this training um, which has been really, really positive really. Um, and the information that we're sharing to help staff teams um, on the wards or in outpatients to understand. But this now has been extended to our therapy, so occupational therapy, physiotherapy. So people will ask us just for specific autism training or they can go on our, um, on our framework, our training framework within the hospital to, to get this. Um, and it's been, yeah, as I said, positive and the feedback's positive. So we develop that and I suppose our services continues to develop. If we look at this, the, the information on the slide, um, the green sticker, that's our, our um, logo, we'll call it, um, for identifying our team within the hospital. Uh, we have an information pack very quickly. So this is an information pack with lots probably hard to see but lots of information in it and we share that with all our um, individuals who have a learning disability and or autism um, and they can either accept it or say no thank you that's not for us. I think one of the um, just want to add this little note as well if anyone's listening we represent what's called the Liverpool University Hospital Trust and that's the merger of two hospitals, which is the Royal Liverpool, where we, Serena and I have been based for over five years now, and another hospital locally that's called Daintree. So if anyone wants any of the documentation that um, we're talking about or wants to look up what we've done as a service, if you Google Royal Liverpool Learning Disability, a lot of them links will come through there. And again, I'll share that with Anthony at the end of the session that he can pass out. Um, it's not currently under the merged trust heading if you search that on Google, so I don't want people feeling that there's nothing online. There's a ton of resources that you're more than happy to take away, look at and look through, including, including what Serena just mentioned about the information pack. I think before we talk about the case studies, I want to talk about a little sort of side project that we've been working on is about the correct flagging and identification of patients. And what we've worked out, which I think is really interesting, is during the, the COVID pandemic and the knowledge that we've now got on the patients who access our service, We've noticed that more people with autism have attended our hospital than ever before. So actually, we think, and we're going to write a, a sort of a piece of work about this, that the learning disability population has decreased in hospital over the last 12 months in our hospital. There might be a myriad of reasons for why, but what I've noted when I've looked at it is the autistic population has increased. And we haven't really delved in too much why. If I was going to guess, I think the routine and, and the world changing around people has been so difficult that hospitalisation has, has basically happened and people have struggled so bad. So we've had to really, really push our knowledge, our skills and our, our efforts into the autistic population who are coming in as patients to us. And I think the other side to that is that when we talk about um, death, uh, which is a really, really difficult to, um, subject to talk about but within the learning disability population what we know is that um, there's evidence to say that people are dying younger um, and we needed to look into that so there's a project a national project called LEADER um, L-E-D-E-R and that looks at um, reviews the deaths of every individual who's died with a learning disability and what has happened recently is that we're looking and nationally they're looking at um, people with autism to see can we get it right what do we need to change to support um, individuals with autism about um, their deaths and understand that group of individuals so again that's been fed into and we will be looking at those um, group of individuals within the hospital um, so again we're, we're supporting national agendas along as trying to get it right for our Liverpool population and it's interestingly enough following on from that is because the population base has changed in our hospital the likes of Serena and I and our wider team have had sort of quite you know extensive conversations about the assessment forms that we complete because we were sort of a couple of years ago like marked and audited against the assessments that we do for patients with learning disabilities and we didn't have to do them for patients who were autistic 
And one of the challenges we've had now is saying, if we're having to support these patients and they're underneath our banner, our umbrella, whatever term you want to use, then they should be receiving the same assessments, risk assessments, same questions as the other patients in our team. So how we go about that, the challenging aspects of more manpower potentially needed to do that, and all other aspects of work are part of our ever going sort of change in service delivery. So it's really interesting that as the population base changes, our service is amending and changing with that, with the needs of people who are autistic. I will, can you move the slides on again, please, my mates? Next one. OK, so there's two slides and the first one is Paul's story, which will be me and the second one will be Serena's, will tell us Gemma's story. Um, and I think what the reason we wanted to talk about real life case studies, I think it brings things home better about how people find hospital stay because we know it's scary and we know the, the perception of hospitals can be really, really frightening. Um, Paul is a gentleman who has high function and autism. He is a really, really intelligent man, very, very shy, very private, very insular gentleman, and often, unfortunately, at times has, has issues with his mental health. Um, because he has an autistic diagnosis, sometimes what we find is a real challenge in our organisation is that when he comes into hospital physically unwell, the mental health team who need to provide further support will often step back because they'll see the words autism on his clinical notes and instantly that, that will then fall to us as a service to pick that up. That's a real, real potential gap because he might have autism, but he also might have mental health problems that needs the, the support and the expertise of that team. So ourselves can help with communication and aid and how to help someone in a hospital, but ultimately they still need to do their job too. But there's been a couple of occasions where we've had to take the reins of Paul's stay. And unfortunately, he's been self-harming on the wards or he's been in a position where he's really, really unwell. And we've got to try and help him whilst at the same time getting physically well enough to get home. And oh, I think he gets like kidney problems and stuff like that. So one of the challenges that we find is making sure that we can communicate with a Paul, it with Paul in a manner that he likes, understands, and is best for him. Paul is fantastic writing things down, but clams up when he has to verbalise it. And one of the things that I realised when I started working with him is if I ask him a question, I don't really get much back from him. But if I ask him to write something down about how he feels, he'll be really, really descriptive about the whole, whole situation, and he'll let me know in words how things are going for him. So he was able to, what he wanted was a log into our systems computers in here to bring his own laptop in to access his own Microsoft Word so he could email me his thoughts, feelings, desires, wants, needs and how we can help. And we were able to provide that for him, knowing that would aid his care in the hospital. We were able to get him a login. We were able to get past the sort of firewalls that sometimes, as we all know, even using Teams now, it's a nightmare. We know these things and we were able to get him an opportunity so he could type up what he needed to send through to me as an email so I could support him. And what we found was a quite almost like a dear John situation, really distance emails to help. And he was happy with the feedback back via email. So instead of having to go and see him where he would feel so uncomfortable, just a, a quick two or three line email from me, he would then instantly feel that he was being listened to and supported in hospital. Part of what he uh, mentioned to me in an email was that he, he liked what he called to pace, walk around. That was his way apart from self-harm and which he could relieve his anxieties and stresses. And obviously, as you can probably imagine, in an acute hospital, that's a quite difficult thing to facilitate and find a space open for somebody to do that. What I was able to do was I was able to work closely with the clinical ward that he was on, speak to the ward manager who was fantastically forward thinking. And he was an empty doctor's office, maybe 10 or 15 meters away from where he was on the ward. And what we were able to do was find him access to that room and we, he was able to walk up and down that room all day. What he found from that was when he felt like he was becoming so anxious or he was really, really struggling, he would politely ask or email me and I would get that room open up for him and he would go and walk around there. Paul came into hospital suicidal and he was really, really low and which is constant day to day working either just by letters, emails or just that little bit of giving him the opportunity to do what he needed to do. He went home from the hospital well and was in a physically and mentally better place. 
I know that with, with with Paul, we'll end up seeing him again at some point, and these will be challenges that we'll have to work with again. There's no, there's no magic button that fixes everything, but we do now have the reasonable adjustment that we can put in place to help support them and also the evidence that's worked previously in the past. So that's a, a one-off story of a patient who is really intelligent, can make their needs really well known, but just wants hospitals to be run slightly different than the norm. And it's okay and it's understandable where you might hear stories of, we can't do things like that. But one of the things that our service has tried to facilitate over the last four or five years is we can try. If something will aid somebody stay in hospital, and that's by providing somewhere to walk, providing a computer to type letters, books or interests or providing family to come and stay, then we will do that because ultimately the aim is someone leaves our hospital well and in a better place than what they came in. And that's one of the examples of a reasonable adjustment that we've used for an autistic patient in this trust. Next one, please, Ivo. OK, so I'd like to introduce you to a, a lady called Gemma. Gemma um, is a individual who's a tw only 26 and she has um, she spends quite long periods of time on the hospital. She will come in for weeks at a time, which is quite difficult and stressful. And she might do this three or four times a year because of her physical health. Um, when Gemma was a child, she had difficulty with um, stomach problems and um, IBS, um, just all the gastric and bowel difficulties. But then nothing kind of came to fruition or light with her when she was in at the children's services. Um, and it was quite difficult for Gemma to, to understand that is there something going on because nobody could find anything. Um, and that was a real challenge to her. What she then, when she reached the age of 16, 17, actually her services stopped in children's services and she was moved to an adult services. And it was at that point that actually one of the consultants saw her and went, this is the problem, this is the challenge, and actually had an understanding of her as an individual, which gave her a sense of relief um, because she was really challenged as a child, really, with, with her stomach and her bowel difficulties. So and that, that's only in the last nine years. So our service has only been here for five years. She lived in another part of um, the country and moved here. So she worked, she works actually in a hospital setting. So her understanding of hospitals and her understanding of um, processes um, is great which sometimes is a challenge because she understands it but can't process the information at times. Also, um, she's um, she works in one of the labs. So again, all her assessments and all her drugs and her information, she has a massive, massive knowledge of. And it's about her not being in a role as her job, but actually her being as a patient. And I think what what the challenge for her was the communication side of her illness. So she would come into the hospital. We have a system um, that as soon as somebody hits A&E or comes in, they will be triggered onto our system so we'll know them there. We will always pop down to see Gemma to say, look, we know you're in if you need anything. When Gemma normally comes into hospital, first of all, she is very acutely unwell. She's usually vomiting and can't just take on board, have a conversation with you. Um, but she knows and then she will email us to say, I feel better, come and chat. Or we will put our head around her door to say, if you need us, here we are. As her stays normally in hospital occur, the longer she gets, the more difficult it becomes with her mental health. Gemma has mental health difficulties as well, and at times can self-harm. And these self-harming can come in the form of, you know, head banging, just frustration, scratching her arms. Um, and um, yeah, she, she becomes quite frustrated. I think what we've worked and how we've supported Gemma over the last few years is a process of that if medical staff are talking to her, actually they need to allow her to process the information, to take on board what they've said, give her time, maybe go away and come back again and say, OK, have you any questions? Because initially what was occurring was that Gemma would get information, they would do ward round every day, we're going to do this, we're going to have this, we're going to whatever. It was overload. 
and she couldn't cope with that, which then she had a host of questions. She couldn't get answered from the day before. And then this processing again from from the new ward round. So we put in place she needed time to process. That was really valuable to Gemma. Gemma normally goes on to the same ward now, and that's what they try and work with. And she normally goes into a side room, which gives her space and time. Um, staff know her so they can go into her at different times during the day um, to see if she's all right. Sometimes Gemma will say, no, I want to be left on my own, which is obviously acceptable. But other times she'll say, no, I want to be left. But actually those cue, you know, kind of small things that the staff know from her being on the, the ward, they'll say, no, let's spend time with you. So again, we also have a good relationship with Gemma's mum um, who will find dad and who will phone us to say, you know, Gemma's just is upset or or can you go and check her to see if she's all right? Because they don't live um, locally. Um, I think from from Gemma suffers with quite a lot of pain and pain management because of her condition. And she has worked really, really closely with the pain team here about understanding her pain, processing her pain and how to manage and work with the pain. Um, and she has now a, a script card that she will bring into the hospital that we've put onto our system about how how she supports the pain. That pain and that script might actually come into self-harming because she can't function really because the pain can be so acute and again it's about it's quite hard and difficult for general nurses so people who work in an acute hospital to understand mental health and that's where we can come and support so we've done a lot of work with the staff on the ward and with Gemma to, to how do we get it right and I suppose from our services everybody's individual so what might work for one person not necessarily work for another so Again, it's about how we do it, listening to the needs of that individual and the people around them if it's important and how do we move forward. So again, um, it's at times Gemma, Gemma's stay will be positive. At times we've had to get the mental health team involved. They've had to come and they then on discharge because she's physically well, but actually her mental health has deteriorated and we will then liaise with her mental health team um, to actually go and support her on discharge from the hospital. So again, there's lots of really positive work going on between us all um, and it's how do we get it right? And that's the reasonable adjustment that we, we've done with Gemma. Okay, just to add to that as well, I mean, one of the things that we've, we've worked with Gemma recently as well is about that sort of ownership of self of how do you manage your mental well-being? How do you manage your behaviours? How do you bring coping strategies into place for you? Because it's fantastic to sit here and I can sit here and say, oh, we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll help. And we always will try our best. But ultimately, we work nine to five, Monday to Friday, and at the moment, no more. So we need people to do as much as they can for themselves and for the wider teams to help as well. So Gemma's got a couple of coping strategies that she uses. Might be listening to music. She likes Pink, the singer Pink. Um, she has what was she's classed as, and I, I wouldn't use the term, but she bought a teething ring, okay? And the teething ring goes around her wrist, and this is a sort of like a bangle where she bites it instead of biting the skin when she gets really, really self injurious yeah. and really, really low. She bought that, it was her idea, and she brings that to hospital. So it's a real good example of somebody understanding acutely what they need. But us as a hospital supporting that to be there for them and making sure that we know that that's something that this patient might particularly need at that time. Um, so part of our process is, 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 as Serena said, spot on, it's working with an individual. So when we spoke before the session to, to Anthony and to Ivo about what we were trying to get across here, I think the key is every person who comes into hospital is different. Every person's individual needs are slightly different. And we need to listen to them. We need to have a culture of honesty where we can say we can try that or no chance that doesn't happen in here and work with a patient, work with a person, work with their family to try and make it a better stay in the hospital environment. And nothing is off limits because we can try our best with everything, but we can have a culture of real honesty as well. Next slide. I think that might be the lot. I think. And I think I think the other side to that is that um, because we have the Mental Capacity Act, 
and also understanding what reasonable adjustment is. It's about us helping and educating our um, the staff here about that um, act really. Um, and that's where our evidence are. We have we have a large understanding, a great understanding of, of the Mental Capacity Act because of the work that we do. But it's just open it up to other people on the wards, consultants also, or the nursing staff um, to help to make changes. And we're allowed to think outside the box rather than being very prescriptive. So I think that's us finished, if that's OK with yourselves. And we can be opened up to question and answers, if that's useful. That's fantastic. Thank you both so much. So that much. is that really... Is really the lived experience element, the patient stories there are really powerful. So with, there are some questions in the chat, which I'll just um, bring to your attention if that if you're happy to answer them. So comment from Catherine, really a comment and then a question. So Paul's story has demonstrated that these patients need a lot of time dedicated to them by specialists like yourselves, which many trusts don't have access to. What's your advice for starting a service like this? How was yours initiated and led? And is there specific funding? OK, so it's a good question. Um, so I'll answer three separate questions. What was the first one, Anthony? Sorry, ask it again. The first one is, is kind of, um, what's your advice around starting a service? OK, the advice around starting a service is I think that's right. I think one of the things that hospitals should do is they should be able to manage a patient with a learning disability or a patient with an autism or both and they should be able to manage them properly without the needs of a specialist service. I think the evidence states that that doesn't always happen and the evidence shows that specialist services are often needed. I think one of the reasons that it's not globally acted upon is that some hospitals don't see a the patient numbers because of flagging, coding and understanding who the population are and b the costs attached to the patient's being in certainly the cost attached to bring in a new service here. We know, you know, respectfully in the NHS that there's cost attached to things and that will make decisions at times. One of the things that we've been able to do to sort of answer that question, we've been able to build up a bank of evidence over the years that we've worked here as a trust of the implications of our service being here on both A, identification of the patients and B, the reduction in their length of stay while they're in hospital. So there's a direct correlation between hospitals with a liaison service, which is what we are, and a reduction in length of stay in hospitals because we can come involved, put in that adjustment, get someone out quicker and ultimately save money. So what we've had to do as well as indicating patient stories and what we've had to do as well as showing how we care is we have to evidence how we've made the hospital money and we've saved the hospital money. And unfortunately, sometimes that rings more bells than just the care aspect alone. We were able to say, following the model of other hospitals, I won't go into it in too much in depth now, but if anyone needs to speak about it, I can in the future. There's a thing called clinical coding. And in a real basic level, if somebody is coded as having a learning disability or a dementia or an autism or other specific codes, the amount of money that they generate for the hospital is more. So the more patients that are known to a service flagged and coded correctly, in theory, can make the hospital more money. Now, this it's a lot more difficult. I broke that down in one sentence. It's so much more complex than that. But what we've had to do is evidence that the patient numbers have increased. So we've been able to say, for example, in the first year that we were a service, we had in total maybe 200 and 250 patients across the year in the hospital of either learning disability and a couple, I think it was three patients who were autistic in that first year, which was 2016. Obviously, COVID slightly skewed the figures, but the last year without COVID, I think we were up to 750 patients and about 300 of them had autism. So actually what you can see is the numbers are vastly different, yet they're still the same two nurses doing that job. We've had to change our role as time's gone on and, and make our job slightly differently, but we've had to evidence to our hospital the reasons why we're here and some of the benefits of it. OK, can I just add to that also? And it's about different models within different areas. So in Liverpool, the model is that they have employed learning disability nurses into the hospital. 
Um, as Jed said before, we've we've joined with another hospital. There's two learning disability there, nurses there. Some hospitals have learning disability nurses. Some hospitals within our Northwest network haven't got um, learning disability nurses, but they will have a lead for, and they might, they, you know, it might be for dementia, learning disability, autism, or whatever. Other models, what's used kind of around the country is that, and I know in Oxford they use this model, so it's a community autism model. So somebody, um, um, a nurse who is a learning disability nurse, but she has specialised in autism, and she is based in the community, but actually she feeds into the hospital. And that again nationally can happen around. So there's no one kind of set fix to to say this is what's going to happen. You need to see within the autism service within your local area to see what they do and how they work. So it can be slightly different or different. So that is that okay? No, that's really helpful. So I think you've answered most of the question. There were three parts to the question, if you remember. So how did you start? Where did your service come from? How was it initiated? Um, you've covered off and I think there's clearly an evidence base that you're pulling together, which is really, really helpful. Yeah. And I think the third part of the question was whether there was any funding available, which I think I'm hearing there's not additional funding, but there's embedded funding. Yeah. And just because people don't see a service exactly like yours doesn't mean there isn't service provision. Correct. Yeah, it's, I suppose it's how, you use, it's how you use your money. It, it, I suppose would be the answer to that. It's it's whether or not the organisation that you're talking about would see the benefits of bringing the service in. And obviously, we're going to be biased. We're going to say, of course, there's a the benefit. But the actually, if we look at it on every single level, there is a benefit because the finances work and make sense. The patient care improves. I think currently, again, it's quite detailed. But currently, as part of the national benchmarking standards. What they're looking at is they're looking at are people dying less in hospitals when these learning disability liaison teams in there? And the question they're seeing from the very small data when they're building on is the answer is yes, they are. There's less deaths. So ultimately, it's a huge difference. Now, we're not going to sit and say it's all down to us. It's not. But what we try and do is we try and embed a culture in our organisation of it's OK to get terminology mixed up. It's OK to be a bit scared because you don't know what's up to date at the moment. And it's OK to ask us and we'll help. So that sort of easy going, breaking things down culture has helped our organisation massively. Now, that could be because Liverpool's like that as a place. That could be because we're like that as a team or that could work everywhere. It's not for us to say. But I suppose what we can say is it works here and staff can come to me and say, Jed, I haven't got a clue about autism. Will you see if this fellow's got autism and will you help me? And my answer would be, yeah, of course, come on, let's do it together. So that culture of learning rather than how don't you know about this, you should know. And that sort of berating someone for not knowing, which doesn't help anyone. We've no, gone no, right understand. away from that model. I understand. So no, I understand. So a couple of other questions. So there's a question here about uh, what reads to me like a community referral for someone with suspected learning disability. They do have ADHD. So what you'll do, so each of our, so there'll be community referral pathways, won't there? Yeah. Which which isn't necessarily what you're describing. So I'm not going to ask you that question, but I'm going to signpost it somewhere else because I don't well, think that it's relevant necessarily to this conversation and I'm not sure that you're going to be able to help. What I could give an answer is if we have a patient who comes into our hospital that's getting referred through to us here acutely unwell, we can contact the local GP and say, we believe that this person may need further looking at or scrutinising or you may need to speak to a community team. It wouldn't sure. be us that would make that diagnosis and it wouldn't no, be no, us that that's the point I'm making. So if they were to present in crisis, you would pick them up and identify them and potentially work backwards. But if someone isn't in crisis, the actual diagnosis itself is part of a community pathway. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, so that's what I thought. Um, someone else in the chat has mentioned the uh, Oliver McGowan training. Yes. Are you able to just explain what that is? Yeah, so so basically what's happened has been, if you don't know the story, Oliver was a young man uh, with a learning disability autism who died in a hospital and um, his mom. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Well, and it wasn't, it was sorry, his, yeah. his, his mum is a real powerhouse, real advocate for staff to be trained in reasonable adjustments in the basics of autism care, the basics of uh, learning disability care. And what she's trying to put in place and what's been put in place is a mandatory training across the whole patch uh, around learning disabilities and autism, which 
isn't live yet, but will be live soon. What I'd like to say, and I'm not just sort of showboating here at all, is that us as a hospital, we were, we were already providing mandatory training to our staff two years before this came about. It's not the same everywhere and we can't comment on everywhere, but basically it's training. So the general population in hospitals or care environments have an awareness about learning disabilities and autism that they may not currently have. Any more on that? No, I, I think, and we're a part of, we will support the Oliver McGowan training as well. Um, I think what's different from theirs to ours is that it's people with autism or people with learning disabilities and autism who've been part of that and it's national. So there'll be a run, um, you know, um, locally each um, area will have their own specific Oliver McGowan training. OK, that's really, really helpful. So loads of positive feedback in the chat for the issues that you've raised and how you've told the stories really powerfully. A couple of asks for some of the links that you described earlier in your narrative. Would it be possible to put those in the chat? So I think you talked about uh, investigation of deaths and you talked about a uh, learning framework. Would it be possible to put those in the chat or would you could we share those afterwards? I, can, I mean, I don't know how to do it from here because we sort of we're hiding like a laptop floating on them. <laughs> but we can, I'm quite happy to send it through to yourselves and you can share it out. Is that OK? Yeah, no, that's absolutely I mean, perfect. Thank if you you know the simplest way of doing it would be to Google. If you Google Bristol, Bristol Leader and if you Google Royal Liverpool Learning Disability on both just normal Google searches, you'll be able to find tons of links to things from there, I would suggest. Brilliant. Brilliant. Really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to just finish off with? So, as some takeaway messages, what are the kind of, of of key things that you'd like people to leave with understanding better? Okay, I mean, from I, I, I'll go first here. I think for me, if a person is coming into hospital, I would be asking whoever's listening to this now: Does the hospital that your loved one or yourself or or somebody you care for have? a service involved that will help and aid them while they're in there and if they do can they make reasonable adjustments for you or for yours that will make it easier whilst in the hospital i think every hospital runs the service that means are either a part of slightly differently and it would be wrong for me to say this is what you need to do each time as we've been able to evidence so far every case is individual almost every hospital is run individually in the way they do it too so my take home message would be find out if there's a service that works in the hospital that you're using that could benefit and help you and ask them for further support whilst there. I think my message would be about um, taking responsibility. So the person who's coming into hospital or having something, thinking about it in um, before the, if they had to be admitted. And it's about helping staff within the wards understand how challenges or difficulties it might occur to them. So things like communication, so processing. So like we know with Gemma, that overload, that too much information. So she has a little cue card to say, I can't process this. Can you come back in 10 minutes? So she's able to do that. So things like that, that might be written down, not too much. So we don't want pages and pages and pages, just one page about how you can support me when I come into hospital. And that might be, I'm very shy. I find it difficult to speak to another person. Um, I like to maybe write things down like Jed's story about Paul. So those things that can be positive and it's about you taking responsibility, I think is is powerful. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's spot on. We obviously end up going to hospital usually because we're not well and no one plans to be not well. But I suppose if we if we use a bit of common sense, most of us are going to end up in hospital at some point. So if you struggle personally with communication or processing or anything like that and have an A4 piece of paper with just some pertinent notes on it that come with you to hospital, it's almost guaranteed your care will improve based on that. Yeah. And I think that would be a real, yeah, find out if someone's there to help and bring in information that will help them, I think would be the, the, the minimum and you'll probably get better care based on them two things alone. And I think it's, you know, things like the lights, the light systems are strobed, you know, so it might be sensory overload from from noise, from lighting, from the, the smells, whatever else. If they if we know about them, well, it's not that we can change it, but we might be able to help or help you understand why we can't change it. And to me, sometimes that's just really, really useful that you can talk about it. 
Excellent. Thank you. So two really two more really quick questions that have just popped up in the chat that I think are quite relevant. And and but if I could just ask you to answer them really briefly. Yeah. So the first one is that you the two case studies that you flagged are really helpful, they're both around adults. Do you work with children? And if not, who does? Not as much all the heck. <laughs> Very quick. Um, we have a children's service and it's called Alder Hay, a children's hospital, it's called Alder Hay, and they have community teams. So again, it's from there and then they move to us. Now, not all hospitals um, within the local area, they have children departments, we don't. Our dental hospital, which is attached to us, takes children and we will work then if there's a need, but not generally, no. Okay, that's really, really helpful. And then finally then, someone is flagging, um, broader kind of communication issues with people not formally diagnosed with autism but who may, might, might make themselves find it difficult to make themselves understood in a hospital environment um, but still have capacity is that any i know there's a, there's a, there's a that's a very broad subject it's common I mean, that's um, common. It's, it's, it's really really common and what we've we've made an agreement amongst ourselves as a team is if somebody benefits from us to help, we will help them regard, regardless of formal or informal diagnoses. That's not the same everywhere, I have to add that, but in here, if somebody hasn't had a formal autism diagnosis, but we believe has got autism and we believe could help them in here, we do, because we know that that's the key, is helping someone in hospital get better. What boxes get ticked really are, are the secondary, a secondary model, aren't they? Yeah, I and I suppose what we can do then is make a referral or give them information to that individual to say, actually, this is a service, it's the Asperger's team within Liverpool and it might benefit you. And they can Google that and look up the information to see other needs better met there. Really helpful. Both, thank you so much for your time to do this. It's been so informative and incredibly helpful. Really grateful. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you for having us on. I appreciate right. it. Bye bye now.